thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it was actually, it's been the opportunity for me to couch on uh, papers, some ideas that I had, but then of course when you start, uh, it, it becomes this very big thing and you start gathering data and it becomes you know, a, a, an entirely new empirical project, whereas it initially it was more of a sort of theoretical piece. Uh, but thank you and also thank you uh, to Bernard and Jim and, and Liz for uh, organizing this and to Stephen for commenting on this paper because I think I sent him three versions of it <laughs> in the space of two days. Um, so thank you for being great. Um, all right, so um, as uh, Pierre Bourdieu uh, pointed out in his three-year course at the Collège de France, the state is the single most important institution organizing the most mundane aspects of our everyday existence. Take time and space, for instance. It is a government, and, and a government under its various forms, which regulates basic elements of temporality. The definition of the legal workday, the school calendar, national holidays, winter and summer hours, and expectations about the daily synchronicity of our individual lives. Government action also shapes meaningf meaningful spatial divisions, too. Uh, administrative and legal rules monitor which aspects of our lives uh, are in fact f public, for instance, and uh, which may remain private. And of course, states also count, measure, categorize, and sort people and things, producing social identities in the process. Occupations and professions, racial or ethnic groups, classes, just to give you a few illustrations. And in addition to Bourdieu, of course, I'm thinking about one of my favorite papers ever, which is this paper by Paul Starr, Social Categories and Claims in the Liberal State. States do so uh, by constituting legitimate categories of actors, state officials, whose raison d'etre is to recognize, sanction, authorize, require in ways that are for the most part imperative and unquestioned. According to Bourdieu, who was twisting the words of Max Weber and Norbert Elias, but really he was building on Durkheim, the state is the locus par excellence of legitimate symbolic violence. The state is first and foremost an instrument of social integration, not only because it elicits and coordinates forms of affective uh, solidarity, but also because its existence and action invisibly but powerfully shape the cognitive faculties of those who are subject to its rule. The school system, the law, and the great rights of institution are the main vehicles of this imperceptible process by which the state inculcates principles of vision and division of the social world. And of course, together with that, the associative, emotional, and moral frames. As such, the state is the principal instrument for the log logical and moral integration of the social world, and that's something that uh, Bourdieu takes directly from Durkheim. Now, seen from this vantage point, it is sometimes easy to forget that nation states are also themselves the objects of considerable symbolic violence. States have many hands on them. They are labeled, evaluated, classified, graded, ranked, praised or disciplined from without by many different kinds of actors with a rationalizing ideological um, or economic purpose. Think international institutions, experts from various professions, social movements, philanthropies, and private companies. So there are national indicators for human rights, for freedom, for ease of doing business, for transparency, for human development, for rule of law. There are hundreds of aggregated economic, social, political, environmental measures that flatten qualitative differences across states and allow for neat country rankings and heat maps. And where numerical scores are too politically sensitive or hard to come by, letter grades have been institutionalized that seem to carry the appropriate mix of firm, firmness and imprecision. For instance, vo the vocabulary of sovereign credit ratings, which I will focus on in a minute, bizarrely reminiscent of the evaluation system of school children, has become ubiquitous over the past three decades, and indeed frames the conditions under which states get incorporated into modern financial capitalism, if at all. 
So the financial industry is indeed the, perhaps the most powerful purveyor of legitimate symbolic violence onto states and their attending societies. In the mid-2000s, for instance, you might have been enticed to put your money on the BRIC countries. The Goldman Sachs London Bureau had popularized this label to, de to designate the four large emerging economies of Briz Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Surprisingly, those four countries soon claimed the label for themselves, you know, the category becomes performative of the identities, um, and turned the term BRICS into a proud political banner, performing and spontaneously fitting the category. Meanwhile, the financial industry grew the BRIC concept into a lucrative business strategy. BRIC dedicated investment funds and, and products flourished as did consulting, branding, and marketing activities fueling new sources of profits for investment banks, consulting firms, credit rating agencies, and the financial press. Thus, Goldman Sachs, in this case, got to define the principles of vision and division of the economic world, but, and this is the point that I want to emphasize here, and I will emphasize throughout this presentation, the classificatory act was all at once an economic act, in the sense that it was designed to um, create profits. Such stories remind us that the economy cannot exist without its attending morality plays, where actors, individuals, corporations, countries are apprehended not only through numbers, formulas, and charts aiming at precisions, but also through rather coarse moral categories of virtue and vice, good and bad, high and low. And the question for me, and the question I'll address in the presentation, is you know, what is the relationship between the measures, the numbers, and the moral categories. So much is at stake because language is never just words. Labels, nicknames, letter grades, and scores elicit positive and negative emotions, rally up economic excitement, or chill expectations, and they create identities. Classificatory regimes, including the classification of states, are an inherent part of the business of finance. The distribution of rewards, symbolic rewards in the international arena is thus deeply intertwined with the extraction of material profit. Put another way, what Nigel Thrift calls the cultural circuit of capital, that is the stories we tell about the economy, the categories we construct to account for it, even to some extent the instruments we produce to measure it, all of that is not just an epiphenomenon floating above some real underlying material structure beneath. It stands at the heart of the very, capitali at the very heart of the capitalist machine. Of course, states are not the only targets of metrological and categorizing fevers. The modern economy and society are filled with comparisons, rankings, certification systems that measure benchmark and thereby regulate the behavior and performance of individuals and organizations. And of course, uh, you can think of the work of uh, Wendy S. Pieland, uh for this. Uh, but the question is, what is specific then about nation state level metrics? You know, what kind of flavor do they have? And I think they do have a different flavor. And they have a different flavor because states represent social collectives and so stand in for more than themselves. As Emil Durkheim put it, the state is not the brain that creates the unity of the organism, but it expresses it. It expresses this unity. It sets its seal upon it. That is, not only the state not only literally emanates from the social collective through a process of representation, it also stands in symbolically for that collective. So, the question is, um, measures of the state in, implicitly are always also gorging society, if you will. And so uh, they not only reflect on society, they come back to touch it. Everyone partakes emotionally in the institutionalized representations of the collective, be they names like the bricks <coughs> or the pigs, which are Portugal, uh, Italy, Greece, and Spain, and you add Ireland and it makes pigs. Uh, you know. um, which, you know, which is also very, uh, which has been used by the financial industry, you know, to, to great uh, symbolic and, and material effect. Okay. Um, 
So everyone also shares in the consequences of these representations. These are not trivial. Metrics matter symbolically and materially. Thus, by assigning positions and comparing states across categorical borders, evaluative institutions also regulate the collective experiences of citizens. In that sense, the metrics are social facts in the Dorkinian sense. They are external and collective and coercive, their effects being felt in all individuals. And I'll say a little bit, uh, there's more in the paper, but how, how individuals might feel. Of course, some metrics bear more significance than others, depending on whether their effects are mostly symbolic, like human rights indices, or whether they are also material. Nowhere, perhaps, is the power of metrics on states more evidence than in the realm of sovereign debt, where financial experts monitor countries' prospects to repay their loans and where, as a result, states' economic value, so to speak, fluctuates by means of interest rates and credit ratings and all kinds of instruments, like credit default swaps and all kinds of other things. The market for sovereign debt has a long history, of course, and judgments about the moral personnel of states have always been at stake in it. But these judgments have recently become much more formalized, so we can try to unpack a little bit how they are made. Uh, this is just to show you uh, credit, uh, the rise of credit rating. This is the, proportion, the percentage of nation states which uh, have a, a credit rating, um, uh, a foreign currency rating, and this is by the three main agencies that you've all heard of, Moody's, uh, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch. And you can see, you know, um, uh, by the 1970s, there was just a very small group of countries that were, that had uh, ratings, and uh, after basically the Latin American debt crisis, you stopped having you know, a, a rise of the number of countries, the number of then percentage of countries uh, rated, and then, you know, the, um, this rise of the number of countries uh, uh, and the explosion of the former Soviet uh, bloc, you know, you, you have all of these individual uh, countries that start also being rated. Um, the other thing that I want to show, which I could see, and I don't think you've seen that, uh, but uh, we got uh, the, uh, over time, uh, the, uh, this is a credit rating, so you see AAA at the top and then the, you know, you go down, and you can see that over time, you know, the first rating that a country receives goes down, which means essentially, you know, the, 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 the way, it's a little bit like the subprime mortgage story, right? Uh, the, the credit system expands towards the poorest uh, countries, and you see that the, the last countries that have been rated, Bangladesh, Rwanda, Zambia, you know, they tend to be the poorest countries, and they tend, of course, to have a, a pretty bad rating. So, you, you know, you start at the top, at the core, and then you expand towards uh, the periphery. Now, the raters rate by means of letter grades, not numbers, with only sl slight variations in the grading schemes used by the main companies. Ratings thus begin with a process that I call in the paper more reduction. The purpose is to characterize in one big stroke, a triple A or a C or B minus, um, the moral personality of the political collective as a, uh, the whole, as a whole. And I, I insist on this term political, because what credit rating agencies is essentially try to assess, and this is a big difference from credit scores for individuals. Now credit scores they essentially assess your capacity to reimburse. For nations, it's different. It's not simply the capacity, which has to do with economic performance measures, but it's also the willingness. And there you get, you know, if you talk about the willingness to pay back your loans, then you enter into a whole different area, which is politically fraught. So you, um, the grades means to assess sort of this moral responsibility of the political collective as a whole and the nature of the social contract between the state and the nation. The question is, you know, is the state going to pay back to protect its citizen or its foreign creditors, for instance? Is the nation going to support the state as it does certain kinds of policies in order to be able to pay back its debt, and so on and so forth? So to identify this particular character and the underlying debt culture, and they, um, they talk, uh, credit rating agencies talk about <coughs> government repayment culture, modern scorecard uh, methodologies rely on a series of weighted criteria. 
mixing measurable economic attributes like a country's economic position or the fiscal capability of its gover government with less clear-cut features such as quote-unquote institutional strengths or perceptions about the probability that certain dramatic events will occur, like a banking crisis. The commensuration process just feeds off the illusion of mechanized objectivity in Porter's term, but not its reality. In practice, what you see is that subjective judgments arbitrate every step of this process, not only to turn the component factors into quantifiable metrics, but also to allow further human discretion in, discretion in the final rating. This is the methodology of uh, standard and pores. Oh, and well, you can see, well, there you can see. Uh, and you can see all the things that enter into a, a credit rating for a country. And so you have you know, the, the traditional measures like your debt to GDP ratio, your inflation rate, and so on that compose the economic score. But then you have these other things, and the most important one being the political score, which sort of tries to evaluate things like uh, political risk, institutional strength, and so on and so forth. Um, the other thing that is really interesting here um, is, well, there are two things. Is this little thing here, that uh, what is called the exceptional adjustment factors. That is, if the model doesn't produce something that uh, you really want, you will actually adjust it uh, fairly arbitrarily. <coughs> so, the murkiness of sovereign ratings and their, and their individual components stand in sharp contrast to the automated character of individual credit scores, which derives from the algorithmic treatments of well-defined quantitative behavioral measure. Um, it is relatively straightforward, in fact, and I spoke to somebody who does modeling for both, both credit scores and credit ratings, and he was telling me that it's very straightforward to model credit scores from individual level factors. You know, you can predict the score with a very high confidence level. By contrast, sovereign ratings are much harder to replicate, and it's precisely because of this and because of this. Right? Uh, these measures are much, much harder to combine. So you'll say why. You know, you'll say that's because of the subjective element, and you will be right. But what does this mean concretely to have a subjective element? Well, we can uh, venture several answers. First, the demand for different states and consequently their value on the market is structured not simply by the state's economic behavior, performance, or culture, but also by the home bias of, uh, of powerful investors and market makers, which has a strong emotional, cultural, and social basis. The educated guess guesses on which market makers rely are in part just that. They are opinions, representations, beliefs, which are formed against the background of a particular and historically evolved social structure. As Pierre Bourdieu has argued, one cannot dissociate the judgments produced within a field, what he calls the position takings, or in our case, the market valuations and evaluations. We cannot dissociate these, these judgments from the social positions of their authors, who is making the judgment, in this case, Moody's and, and powerful investment banks in the West, mostly. Um, so we have to think about the relationship of the judgments to the social positions of their author, both relative to each other and, to the and relative to the judgment targets, which are the states, Ecuador, India, Botswana. Okay? Um, and these positions, of course, have material as well as symbolic sources, for instance, Small countries and many large countries in the South are typically unable to borrow internationally in their domestic currency. Uh, so, you know, if you borrow uh, in a foreign currency, your credit rating is going to be lower than if you borrow in your own currency. This is called, economists call this the original sin. I love this. Uh, the position of it. There's a lot of countries, basically, all the countries except for the very powerful one, uh, ones in the world, you know, uh, countries that can emit in euro, dollars, Swiss francs, and the yen probably are the, you know, are the powerful countries. And then the other ones have to emit in a country that is foreign to them. Well, if you emit in your local currency, um, you're going to have. Uh, 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 higher cre credit rating. I mean, that's complicated reason for that, but but essentially most countries can do that, right? 
so they have to they have to borrow in uh, in a foreign currency, which means generally actually uh, a, a lower credit rating. Um, sometimes it means uh, it means uh, lower interest rates, so it's a little complicated. But nonetheless, uh, it, uh, it exposes countries to a much higher level of risk. That's why the credit rating is lower, because you know if their currency depreciates, then suddenly the debt can balloon and double in size, for instance. Um, so this situation of original sin is associated with a systematic and enduring rating disadvantage. Um, and uh, different kinds of interest rates. But second, in the field, so to speak, of the financial markets, this relational structure takes a very particular inedit form. This is what Keynes called a beauty context, where each actor's judgments aims both at differentiation, which was Bourdieu's argument, you know, the judgments are reflective of the positions in the field, but here in the financial market, it's quite different because the judgments also aim at convergence with the other judgments, so you can actually predict where the field is going to go. Okay, so there's something very specific about this particular mechanism that I don't think somebody like Bourdieu talked about. Um, if you will, in the financial markets, the actors have to produce their judgment in a way that is recursive or second degree so they can predict game and ultimately benefit from the collective judgment. So to paraphrase Keynes, it is not simply that market actors must choose the best state, the state with the most value, if you will, in their own judgment, nor even those that average opinion genuinely thinks are the best, right? They, they must actually figure out um, and anticipate what average opinions anticipate what average opinion is going to be, right? And even more than that, you can go to the second or third and fourth level, right? So it is toward achieving this recursive goal that market evaluators produce and incorporate all kinds of information about the moral persona of states and their attending societies. In that sense, preconception if you're trying to figure out what more, what average opinion is going to be, preconception, stigma, infatuation with certain countries, like the BRICS, disenchantment with other countries, like the pigs, um, this is all fair game. It is also why, so on the one hand, you have this preconception that stay there, on the other hand, you still have this push for rationalizing. So it's also why financial market actors pressure states to conform to certain moral ideals by developing specific fiscal, legal, regulatory, accounting, and accountability measures. But the fact, and mechanisms, but the fact is not that, notwithstanding efforts at formalizing, quantifying, and standardizing these variables, the process of state valuation cannot be isolated from the history of structural relations be between the investors and the invested in, as well as from fads and fashions created through and for the benefit of finance. It is deep inside the black box of the, uh, which is, the, which I opened here, right? The, deep inside the black box of the sovereign credit, um, uh, the sovereign risk ratings, that the symbolic violence that is the product of the whole structure and its history is turned into a material feature and a material weapon which, uh, which is, of course, risk-based pricing. That is, you know, these letter grades that we talked about are not innocuous. They correspond to a very particular differentiation and hierarchization of countries on the material side, not simply on the symbolic side, on the material side, where they have access to uh, different kinds of interest rates and loan terms. And thus, that's the process through which A countries, B countries, and C countries are produced. To be sure, the hierarchy allows for some movement. You know, countries move between B and C, and sometimes they move up to A. Um, but by and large, the dominance in the game, broadly speaking, the Western industrialized countries, with a senior age right, that is, which can emit you know, debt in their own currency, have remained very secured in their AAA position. Although the US had a brief <laughs> moment of um, and I talk about that in the paper, actually. You know, when the U.S. threatens not to repay its debt and has, you know, this massive showdown, there's a slightly, you know, the, the credit rating agencies have, you know, 
a, a, a response, but it's a fairly muted response. When Ecuador does this, you know, it goes down to triple C right away. So the mechanisms of this social reproduction are both economic and moral. On the economic side, risk-based pricing ensures that the financing of state debt is cheaper at the upper end of the social scale and more expensive at the bottom, creating self-fulfilling dynamics. On the moral side, the rolling out of disciplinary mechanisms, the sting of finger pointing and stigmatization may create the conditions of their own failure. Through economic fiascos, for instance, and all society's resistance, you can see the Greek case right here, uh, and some of these dynamics have really played out in the Eurozone crisis. Or sometimes you have not um, a sort of a, a failure of the, of the disciplinary mechanism, but you have the, the disciplinary mechanism, if you will, is uh, accepted from within, right? Uh, where uh, states accept their own stigma, you know, as in the, go in the Goffmanian sense, uh, you know, they accept their own spoiled identity. The great example for me is Ireland, right? The Irish suck it up. The Greeks demonstrate, but the Irish, you know, just took like 20% in salary cuts and just suck it up. On both fronts, then, countries will come to spontaneously fit the categories that were seemingly made for them. Cultures and institutions will come across as unreformable, right? States will go into default, and then these, will, these events will become part of the record that accumulates to redefine the future, part of the social structure upon which the new ratings will be produced. Right, so there is a performative element in the ratings that I talk about in the paper. So my purpose has been here to contribute to a theory of the state, if you will, as it is practice. You know, what is the state as a, as a category for the actors who talk about the state and measure the state and value the state? What does that mean? So it means studying what states are to those people who claim to be the state or to be interacting with the state, or to be measuring, or watching, or protecting, or working for the state. You know, so there's clearly parallels between you know, this work and what uh, Sarah and Damon are doing, what Armando is doing, what he's doing. That there's this sort of basic Durkheimian constructionism, if you will. And the only way, I think, to carry out this kind of project is to draw from a series of very specific empirical contexts. Now, there are many ways to develop such a theory, from ethnographies of the policing of the state-society boundary at the physical interface between the two. You know, that's this French, this French uh, tradition of the politique du guichet that we talked about a lot in the previous um, uh, conference. Um, but, you know, there are historical studies of what counts as public expenditure, Sarah's forthcoming book. You know, my focus here has been on what the state is or seems to be for those to see, who seek to classify, quantify, and ultimately put a monetary value on it for the purpose of commodification. So that's a very particular empirical project, but I think it's one that is a fruitful uh, and that brings about uh, interesting theoretical in, you know, um, uh, avenues. Um, so I show that the concept and its boundaries are very blurry, deeply malleable and contingent, the result of ongoing negotiations between the sovereign, its investors, and the market intermediaries, like the credit rating agency. Through the institutional conduit, in fact, of the credit rating agencies, financial markets are uh, all at once treat the state as a unitary persona with a historically derived moral character and an independent will. You know, they evaluate the state's willingness to pay. How, how, much, you know, how individualized is that? But they, are also, they do so by making all of these educated guesses about the nature of the democratic social contract, you know, what the nation is, who these people are, ultimately. And that's you know, a whole other kind of worms. And I'll just leave you with that. Thank you. Great. So we'll have a... Should I do it from here? Whatever you feel like. Oh, I don't know. If we, you prefer the microphone, right? I think it's easier. Okay. Easier. Yeah. Um, okay, so I was I was thrilled to have a chance to comment on this paper.
Uh, I found the subject uh, extremely compelling on its own, but uh, certainly for the Many Hands project, uh, the sort of number of people, groups, uh, authorial positions, et cetera, involved in the process of the fiscal construction of a state as, as such seems to me to be one of the best examples of, of the many hands uh, metaphor. Uh, and even as it's turned into many hands on the state instead of of the state, and I'll, I'll, I'll make reference to that uh, in a moment, but that um, proposition seems to be a, an interesting twist as well. Um, I was also thrilled to see sort of, a, uh, sort of not a representative, but somebody interested in, this, in these questions of the moral sociology of the state, uh, which really has been pushing in some, in some fantastic uh, new directions. Um, and then this idea of sort of constructing the state from the outside seems to me to be something uh, that, is, that is interesting, even though I want to sort of perhaps problematize that a little bit, but I think that that's really a... Uh, there is one just quick uh, reference as I, uh, uh, as I was looking at the comments this morning. I, I was immediately uh, taken back to, to, to Jim's paper yesterday and the ways that the CRAs, these uh, credit rating agencies, uh, transform these states into single cultural entities is strikingly similar to the kinds of things that, that Jim was talking about in IR in, at, in, in the post-war period. And this, um, there's something, uh, when you're operating at the level of international regulation, something is also strikingly similar to the, some of what you've done, Bernard, in terms of um, Beccaria and then looking at the Chicago Board of Trade and the construction of these markets and the attempt to m make them sound coherent uh, from the outside, such that then you can create, somehow you can create kind of some kind of even, in theory, even playing field, uh, which is obviously uh, not even at all, as, as you've shown, but that, that constructing these as unified entities is an essential sort of first step to that process. So that, that just seemed to be, to be an, an interesting connection. So, but beyond that uh, point, uh, I'd like, I have sort of four uh, larger points uh, that, uh, that also have questions attached to them. Uh, so we talked about this yesterday, um, and uh, uh, th there's a real tension, I think, and, and this came out in, in the framing, I think it came out in, in some of the discussion, it came out in, uh, Bernard, you and I were talking afterwards, a, uh, a sort of tension in Bourdieu's courses on the state uh, be between what we might call his amended Weberianism, uh, that is this addition of the symbolic, on the one hand, and his Durkheimianism. Uh, and uh, not that we want to turn this into uh, sort of pitting one French scholar against the other, I think it's right, we, uh, that, that's not the point here. Uh, but I am interested in, in how you set the paper up by, with this, and, and, you, and you set it uh, here as well. Um, and it's too bad Loic isn't here because he, he, he likes to do this too. So he'll say, you know, Bourdieu was saying this, but he really meant this. Um, and, and, and you say, um, so according to Bourdieu, who was twisting the words of Max Weber, this is a quote from your paper, and Norbert Elias, but really building on the work of Emil Durkheim, the state is the locus par excellence of legitimate symbolic violence. And then you later argue, uh, further on in the paper, Quote, as Emil Durkheim put it, the state is not the brain that creates the unity of the organism, i.e. society, but expresses it. Okay, and then you go on and you say, thus by assigning positions and comparing states across categorical borders, evaluative institutions also regulate the collective experience of citizens. In that sense, the metrics are social facts in the Durkheimian sense. They are external and coercive. And that's why I want to come back. Um, it seems to me, um, I'm not quite sure why then all this, the, the, the relationship between externality and coercion here seems to me to be, um, uh, or at least I'd like for, you know, to sort of discuss this. It seems to me in some ways Durkheim was arguing quite the opposite. That is, there is no outside, okay? So there is no external, that coercion is ultimately the fact that you can represent or that the society can have uh, a kind of... Uh, uh, I don't want to say representation because it's more than a representation, but that it can find an outlet in the state that then acts back upon itself. I mean, that seems to me to be at the heart of, of what Durkheim is saying. So things may appear external, and that, is, that may be where the legitimacy comes from, but they are not external of, from society in any real way. Um, and so, um, so, the, so I wonder um, if it is meaningful or consistent with Durkheim um, 
and with what even you're saying in the beginning of your paper in that first uh, that that these are external uh, that these are external factors in any meaningful way, and I'll come back to that in a minute. They're external to citizens. You're right that the product of I mean, they're you know tied to society. It's, it, they're social facts in the sense that you cannot oh. dissociate from the fact that they are collective. Yeah, sure. exactly. But they are external to citizens. Yeah, but I think I think that's why. Also I'm, to the state itself. Yeah, so I think that's where we might need to th right because citizenship versus state, you know, and, and and how this is going to play out. I think that the externality there is 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 an issue, um, but yeah, so that makes. Um, but it, so, and then there's a second uh, point. So it seems to me then, moving from the introduction, that there is a, um, a decalage, if you will, between the introduction uh, that, that treats these issues, and then, um, and then once you move into the paper, uh, how you've constructed the, the objects of study, namely the state on the one hand and the financial industry on the other. Um, in particular, I'm interested in, in, in who, so sort of, I, who is this financial, what is, who is this financial industry? I guess that's the, that's the strange way of posing the question. Um, and I, the, I, for the state, I think that this is, um, you know, you're, 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 I like this idea of constructing the state as a, we'll talk about this tomorrow with Foucault, you know, the, the state as a shape or as, a, as, as an effect, as, as a legitimating discourse that can, that can invoke a whole set of powers and almost constructivist in that sense. But it seems to me that it's difficult to do that to the state without also doing it to the financial industry, right? And it seems to me that, the, that in your story, the finance industry has a sort of agency that states don't have. And I'm not sure that it's any less constructed than, uh, than, than the state, if you will. Um, the third... Um, Point um, and this is this, these are all sort of then building on that on that question, um, and it relates to a specific line in your paper. But I that I th unless I misread the paper, that I think is important. Um, and you say uh, I quote: "Hardened ratings may receive a lot of public attention, but they would be toothless if no one used them. Today's credit ratings are powerful because states decided they would be." Now again. In, in, a, in, in a project on the many hands of the state, I'm wondering how, who is this state that, that, has, that has given them uh, this power? I mean, I'm thinking about the kinds of, where, where, do, I inter where do I encounter credit rating, uh, you know, the CRAs and what they're doing to, you know, the French credit rating and that? It's around the dinner table, right? It's around the guy who got, you know, who, who you know is going to get fired, the, right? So, so, these constructions go, go down quite a ways. And then they go up, of course, to European civil servants or the OECD or the, or, or the European Central Bank or in, in the French case, or the, or, the, or the French Bank or negotiations. So when you say that states make them meaningful, I'm wondering how that, how that works, right? Because it seems that you have, a constru you have this kind of, unless I'm misreading you, but you have a constructivist view on the one hand. And then on the other hand, um, the, the state acquires an agency that, uh, that, 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 uh, that it might not have. Um, and, and so then this is the, the, the fourth point. You, you, uh, another quote, you say, states together with central banks and international financial institutions collectively constructed the hand that placed them under the rule of financial markets. Um, and I guess, again, I, I'd, I'd, ask, I'd, ask the same, I'd ask the same question again, which is that, are they under the rule of financial markets, or is it that you have, it seems to me that in, in many ways what, what you're arguing is that you have a kind of co-construction of, um, of ways of deploying coercive force, but that, that, that really reach out in some, and that the state on the one hand is something that one can invoke, and a credit rating agency is something that, that, that a state can invoke, right? That, that, you know, that these different actors can invoke are all ways that, you know, everything from, oh, I'm not going to hire somebody this month or I'm going to, to all the way up through, oh, well, we're going to, you know, change this or that policy or we're going to lend money at this rate, that this is, that these are both kind of variable on either side. So I guess that, that was sort of what I wanted to push it. And really, I'm just sort of, you know, the idea is it's sort of inspired by the way that I, I think you're trying to spin this out, but, um, 
some of the conclusions. So I hope that's helpful. We have about 20 minutes for discussion. It's up to you, Melion, if you want to respond or if you want to collect some more questions. Or Can I have a response? Yes. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm actually glad that you pointed that out because it's the part that I didn't really get to okay. present the, the part about how states uh, place themselves under the, you know, through Basel II rules. Uh, uh, you know, this, this very important agreement that sort of essentially transformed the degree of being spread views. Um, just sort of the notion that, that banks would have to help hold capital reserves um, that were weighted by the by uh, the risk of the assets that they were holding, and but the risk was not assessed by say public regulators, you know, but it had to be assessed by these external agencies. So suddenly, you know, all of the assets that banks were holding were assessed by credit rating agencies, and of course, banks also hold a lot of sovereign debt, which means that sovereign debt. Um, but but uh, you know in in the 1970s, if you look at you know how, especially in the sort of continental Europe, how states use finance. Essentially, you know they told their banks, well, you know you need to buy. <laughs> we are going to issue some debt, and you you're going to buy it. And essentially, that was the way it was working. Uh, by moving to a system of sort of open finance, suddenly states constrain themselves to become sort of responsible borrowers. And um, so, yes, it is a construction on both sides. You're absolutely right. The power of finance is not sui generis. Uh, it is something that has evolved, and that, uh, you know, and that is the result of a series of mm -hmm. policy actions to liberate finance from precisely the whole of the state. So there's a, both a, it does a very important ideological and uh, story to tell about you know, how that came about. And, work is, is yeah. important in, in, in helping to understand how that shift came about. So it's not that I'm, you know, I, I don't think that the, the the finance side is less constructed than the state side. Mm -hmm. It's just that the moment that I'm looking at right now in history uh, is essentially uh, uh, defined by this power of finance. Not to say that states have no power of <coughs> finance. There's this, you know, the, um, states still get to define how assets should be uh, uh, sometimes um, evaluated. So for instance, in, in Basel II, uh, there is this rule that sovereign debt has to, if it's emitted in the local currency, it should be considered AAA. That's one of the reasons why banks you know, stocked up on, on this sovereign debt and, and started mm -hmm. holding massive quantities of it again, you know, for capital reserves. There was a, the uh, European Central Bank um, also had a, a, a rule saying that uh, the debt of the uh, the sovereign debt of the different eurozone countries in the eurozone should be considered a completely safe asset. Well, that's the reason why everybody bought Greek debt rather than German debt because Greek debt was, you know, paying higher. Yep. Uh, so you know, so 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 you know, you're right that. Political institutions still, you know, have a lot of say actually in in in, in, in and so it's the result of this would negotiation. You, would, would you be willing to go so far as to say that they're actually, in I mean that that in a strange way, uh, you know, a lot of these sort of central state actors are in fact increasing their their ability to coerce their populations through that this that they have a lot of agency in. Oh yeah, they do, and and you know, and especially after the sovereign debt crisis, you know, there's a crackdown on, on credit rating agents. So it's you know, it's an ongoing process of negotiation. But still, the fact that you know, how is it that and, and some states have a lot more power in this than mm -hmm. others, right? So you know, if you're Botswana or if you're you know, if you're Bolivia, it's very different than if you're France or Germany. So you know, so it's I think it's it's important to yep. say, and it's also important to sort of look look into the plus well, so Okay, I've been collecting. I've got four people on the list already, so I think maybe what we'll do is collect some questions. Oh, more? Yeah, okay, great. So I think it'd be good to collect some questions and then um, give you a chance to respond. So I first have Ajay. 
Great. Um, so I really enjoyed this paper. This is a, a terrific project. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more of it. So I have two sort of observations. One is, and they follow up uh, nicely from your response to, to Stephen's comments. And one is about uh, the historical moment. So that you were trying to, I think a minute ago, you were trying to historicize yourself to explain why you're, why you're looking at this. And I was a little surprised because this struck me as a very pre-2008 kind of view of financial markets because the credit rating agencies, if, if anything we've learned from the crisis, are completely disingenuous. Um, and so if you are talking about to, to, to the 2013 and what it means, this is not at all what people think of the credit rating agencies, both in finance and in the global economy largely. I mean, they, 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 their, their credibility has really, really been shot since the crisis. So I would think that you would want to at least account for that somehow um, and as you think more about this. And then, Secondly, sort of related to that is, so, so if I was a, a neoclassical economist looking at this, I'd say, well, yeah, this is, you, I think you've nicely, in this uh, clever sociological way, talked about uh, the symbolic power that occurs. But at the end of the day, it's really about market forces. And the best example is the US one, which you do mention, and you mentioned briefly here. And, and this actually supports your, your claim about the power of states at the end of the day, right? So your response to Stephen just now is that the ultimate power still really rests with states. And there's no better example of that than what's happened with the US fiscal crisis, right? Because what happened, you had credit agencies who actually did downgrade the US sovereign debt, right? The, so not but that's a huge, it's unprecedented, yeah. right? But what happened to the bond market? Nothing. Yeah. It was a complete blip. It was a non-factor, right? This is so the neoclassical economists would say, these credit rates, it doesn't really, this symbolic power you're talking about has significant limits because at the end of the day, if we look at the bond market, the spread on U.S. Treasuries hasn't changed. It hasn't, you know, we've been talking about a deficit crisis in this country back in the 80s, and we're doing it again, all this, all this, all this brinksmanship with this credit. But investors aren't responding, right? And so the, the, I think the neoclassical, the, you, I think, want to harness in some ways because it supports your claim about the ultimate power of states. But you also want to, I think, um, address more significantly is, is, is the demand side. And so what's missing from the story are the, are the institutional investors who at the end of the day really do determine whether credit rated agencies have any power or not, or whether or whether it really is about how investors coming to the bond market determine what matters. Sarah. So this wasn't what I was gonna say before, but hearing these comments, mm -hmm. I do think one of the things is that talking, putting more up front of the paper, the relationship between credit ratings and capital requirements is gonna, cl will clarify a lot for people, because if you're less familiar with how important capital requirements are for how banks and investors manage their money and kind of the fights that people have over it. <coughs> I mean, I think that's such a key mechanism that it'll help, I think, um, especially people who are kind of less familiar with this space. Mm -hmm. um, but so I was actually thinking of this history, and this may not end up, I, I'll couch this saying it might be too big for this paper. But like these two moments, the kind of 1980s, and you kind of quote Thomas Friedman, but I mean at one point, I forget where he talks about like in depth, like the like rating agencies going and meeting with central bankers and saying, this is what you need to do to get this rating. There's this like, you know, these like direct coercive mechanisms where people are adjusting how they're gonna repay it. I think kind of pulling out more of those stories adds to this kind of account of how this is this like, disciplinary mechanism that's like deeply constructing. Um, and then there's like the deep historical story that this is this kind of rationalization, the kind of reputation of ability to pay your debts is one of these like core stories of state building. And there's actually like, I think, potential for a kind of a deeper, so I'm so excited about this, quite clear, <laughs> for like an even deeper kind of construction of the state as a moral category kind of when we get to the beginnings of state making, right? So it's that Savage writes about, you know, it's, it's states of credit shows that like states that were able to borrow money more quickly are able to gather an army more quickly and form better, right? Like better defend themselves. So this is a kind of a later rationalization of these deep, deep processes of the kind of ways that markets and states kind of come together. And I think the idea of kind of focusing on these kind of moral reductions and the moral valence of it provides a lovely, a kind of a deeper kind of cultural sociology way of, of interceding in it. So um, they might be kind of for different things, but I see kind of a lot of um, exciting kind of places you can go with this. Bill is next. I was just pointing to Damon, because I didn't know you could <laughs> see him. Oh yeah, I have him on the list. But you're next. Yes, no, I was pointing oh, to Oh, you were pointing. Oh, you didn't. Yeah, I was trying to get your attention. Okay, well, in that case, actually, Bernard is next. 
similarly, when you are, you, you know, when you're saying, you know, the neoclassical argument, and, you know, and I have this argument with my husband, who really is a neoclassical <laughs> <laughs> All the time, he's like, you're talking about Moroccan, but in the, at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, you know, it's rational for, uh, you know, to, to, this whole thing is happening very rationally. Um, and I, I'm glad that you brought up the, the U.S. example. So yes, the U.S. was downgraded by Standard and Poor's from AAA to AA, and then it got a negative rating from state AAA, but from Fitch and, and, and Moody. That's a very small change. It's a very symbolically significant one, but it's a very small change. And yes, no change at all in the bond market. Look at Japan. Right? Japan's debt is now over, two, it's about 230% of GDP, way, way higher than Greece, way higher than, you know, most of the most indebted countries in the world, still has an A, nine, a, a rating of the rates. Um, and, you know, very low interest rates. Why? In part, because, well, in Japan, it's mostly the uh, Japanese who hold Japanese debts, so nobody cares. Uh, and in the U.S., everybody still wants Europe. So, the, the, I, I, I think it completely reinforces my point. There are countries who can do that, right? And there are countries who can't, right? Who can have a, a sort of uh, uh, um, raise fears about, you know, not paying their debt and, and not having consequences for that. The U.S. actually can do it. Uh, and so that's part of the social structure which defines the way in which the actors in the field perceive the country, right? So that's part also of the moral capital that the U.S. is able to accumulate. So I'm not sure that it actually changes my argument. I actually, in, in, in some ways, it makes it stronger. Um, Sarah. Um, yeah, and, and actually, uh, maybe to finish on, on this point, capacity of states to resist is here. Is here. Well, they could bring, you know, they could change the way, for instance, they, you know, they could use public regulators and very regulating agencies to, you know, to regulate this capital with their price. I mean, that would be a way to completely, you know, eviscerate the whole, the whole business, right? So, they, you know, there's plenty of ways. After all, states are sovereign. They get to define uh, the rules of the economic game. So there, there's plenty, uh, and, and in the same way that the decision to make the credit, to, to embed the credit ratings at the heart, the private credit ratings at the heart of finance was a historical decision made by states. It, it could be reversed. But, yeah. but you just said this thing, states are sovereign, but so is the implication that some states are less sovereign than others, because some of them can't resist? Some of them well, can't change states the rules so are sovereigns in the, in, in the sense that they, get to, uh, so if a state, for instance, to give you this example of, you know, debt in local versus foreign currency, um, if a country emits debt in its local currency, this debt is under jurisdiction from the country. The country can change the rules. That's what happened with Greece. The debt, you know, emitted by Greek banks under Greek jurisdiction, the rules were changed and the banks had to take a haircut. But the Greek, the, the debt, the Greek debt that was emitted in London, it was not a foreign currency, so it's not exactly the same thing, but it's, you know, it's still emitted in a different jurisdiction. There's no sovereignty there, so there's no, you know, nothing. So if a country is very, is much more able, precisely because it is at the heart of finance and it is, you know, it, it is a financial service, so the country is much more able to, um, to control the rules of the games of finance because of geographical location, um, then uh, I mean you can see the implications for uh, you know, controlling the ways in which um, finance can play to the advantage of the disadvantage. I mean it's it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just I think it's a, a simple mm -hmm. um, Sarah. So yeah, I mean the capital reserve requirement is super important, um, and you, I mean, and you're right about the, the actually maybe teaming up with Asia <laughs> 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 to you know to see indeed you know how you know how debt how important debt is in the sort of mobilization, including fiscal mobilization, which is sort of interesting. I mean, uh, uh, so yeah, I think. 
what is really interesting about the credit rating agency, they have been pushing, not simply for certain kinds of policies, but they have also been pushing for accounting, you love that, accounting rules change. So for instance, France has been pressured to incorporate uh, off balance sheet, you will love that. Yeah, this is your work. France has been, uh, yeah, so off balance sheet commitment to future generation, all the future pensions into the calculation of debt now. And that made debt, you know, basically go from 60% to 120% of um, GDP. So, some, you know, there was this big report that had, you know, this number, and everybody was, ooh, you know, <laughs> suddenly, so it's not that the debt that has changed, it's, you know, the, it's the rule. So, and uh, indeed, if all the countries are subject to this rule, then nobody's people anymore, right? So it completely changed the, the, the power plays. Um, May I have one more minute? One more minute. Okay. Is Bourdieu wrong? I, I don't think I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to <laughs> 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yes. the, the paper is not written as Bourdieu wrong. The paper is written as Bourdieu paid attention to the classificatory you know, effects inside, and I want to look. I mean, it, maybe you put more into me, uh, you thought I was more sophisticated than I am. <laughs> but, but it, it, it's just a question of like, what is the relationship then, in other words? I mean, so why, why is he a bookend, and why is he a bookend? Uh, why is he a bookend? Or, and, and then because he, he drew attention to classification, and, and uh, you know, and that was to me that that's a very very important uh, aspect of sort of the new theories of the state is to think about this process of classification. But I think we can think about it sort of from without. In, in a very different way. I, I, I probably have to. Oh, and I didn't answer me. Yeah, I mean, uh, the paper starts with all of these other measures, right? And how the question is, how, how do states come to fit their categories? Uh, I think they do. I mean, states actually end up performing their role. And, I mean, I guess it depends on how the... Uh, is a category symbolically high, you're more likely to perform, want to perform the role. So I don't know, the Scandinavian countries, you know, they want to be the good guy all the time, right? So they, <laughs> so on all of these, uh, on all of these indices, they are always sort of uh, uh, on top. I mean, I think it, it, it depends if, if you want to like a general theory of how states come to fit spontaneously the categories, you'd have to look at the position within the, the hierarchy. Um, I don't know, I don't have a good view. No, I don't have a good view. <laughs> Thank you for a great paper and great discussion.